welcome everyone good morning good afternoon good evening depending on wherever you are uh, joining from uh, welcome to another session uh, of power platform classmates um, again apologies since we had to move this session from last week to this week uh, due to some circumstances but finally we thought we could start um, and, uh, taking ourselves back with some good knowledge on ALM in power platform uh, from the nether and to start with and uh, before we actually go into uh, Diwali um, holiday mood in India and uh, other festivals uh, across the globe uh, again you know uh, Thanksgiving is coming up uh, next week so you know let's get some knowledge uh, shared uh, across all our uh, members today and uh, so we have two sessions um, so in the agenda we have two things one is Jiva is going to talk about uh, Microsoft Ignite updates and then the Nidharan is also going to talk about uh, ALM for Power Platform, right? Um, so I'll hand it over to Jiva to talk about some Microsoft Ignite updates, um, just a revision, just to, you know, something for us to take back. Um, and uh, over to you, Jiva, and then we'll followed by that, uh, you know, Dharni will um, walk us through ALM in Power Platform. I think one of uh, the most talked about topics and uh, me personally, I haven't been able to get it right. Uh, so hopefully this will, you know, uh, help all, you know, clarify our doubts uh, immediately. Um, so all right, uh, welcome everyone. I hope you all have an enjoyable session today. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jiva. Thank you, Priyash, and thank you everyone, uh, no, all the organizers for kindly organizing this session. And thanks all the atten all attendees for joining from um, all throughout the world. Uh, really appreciate it, and it means a lot for us to spending your personal time and the weekend to uh, you know join and then take something from the session. Hopefully, we will deliver our best. And please feel free to unmute and ask many questions if you have. And this is we strongly feel that Power Platform Classmates is a, a forum where we share and we exchange information rather than just you know it's <clears throat> flowing the information from one side to the the side yeah so with that uh myself uh, uh jiva um, uh, i am based out of auckland new zealand and i'm working as a solution architect in uh, fusion 5 here and i'm also a microsoft business application the mvp uh, for the last three years and i'm also microsoft certified trainer and i do organize uh, events and uh, dynamics 365 in power platform in singapore and uh, chennai tamil nadu and also uh, across asians um, and also i do write some blogs and contents here and there whenever I get a chance. So yeah, that's a quick introduction about myself and I will share my LinkedIn um, and Twitter URL later. And if you have not connected, please feel free to connect uh, with me. And so there are tons of tons of updates um, on Power Platform Space and some from Dynamics Space and the Ignite. So before uh, starting the updates, uh, may I know how many of you have attended or I mean uh, had a live had a chance to see the live sessions in the Ignite or had a chance to see the recordings from the Ignite. Can you please raise your hand? Even if it's one session. Golaknath, yeah. Yes, Golaknath is the only one who attended, who uh, gone through the Ignite session. I did not. <laughs> That's good then. <laughs> I mean, yeah. for me, because I have more information to share. Thanks, Golaknath. Appreciate it. Okay, so what I do is there are, uh, I'm going to share something called Book of News uh, from Ignite that Microsoft has put together uh, to kind of, you know, to review all the updates that are the announcement that they have made in the Ignite shortly in the, in the chat. Uh, what I have here is uh, some of the uh, recent announcements that as announced in as part of Ignite and also before that. So it's not just uh, only the Ignite updates what I have here. And what I have here is not the complete updates as well, only some of them that I have explored and I have tried, right? So the right title for this slide probably would be Microsoft Ignite 2022, which Jiva tried or Jiva uh, read through, to be honest. There are more than this. So please don't um, uh, think that this is the only updates that Microsoft has launched, uh, announced. Uh, that's why I'm going to share the book of news here so that you can go through the other contents as well. So uh, let me start with uh, Dynamics 65 and Power Platform Space here. Uh, may I know how many of you have used Dynamics 365? Can you please raise your hand? One, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
that's nice. So we almost have uh, of the audience who have used Dynamics 365 and assume rest of us uh, uh, purely on Power Platform. So, uh, and and that's uh, probably I'll start with Dynamics 365 announcement, which is only like a couple of them. And then I'll move into the Power Platform, which will be more interesting for most of the audiences here. So for Dynamics 365, so if you have used the sales uh, Dynamics 365, so we have, uh, uh, it's been a couple of recent announcements on the dashboard. So there's, there are a nice Power BI embedded dashboard that comes out of the box with, along with the Dynamics 65 sales. And uh, those Power BI dashboards are, uh, uh, it's pretty much, you know, like advanced. It has a nice um, information in terms of analytics. You can see there, it will show the amount, number of contacts and accounts that's flown in and uh, recent times in, 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 in X times of X interval and then amount of opportunities that's been converted and closed. You know, all this, uh, you can imagine all the Power BI capabilities. It's been, you know, built as a dashboard here and uh, you can explore it in the as part of the you know i will share some reference links after the session for this one whatever i'm talking here and you can explore them later but uh, the whole point is that there are nice power bi analytic dashboards that's been embedded as part of the dynamic system sales which will definitely give us uh, a nice experience to the seller and also the no other uh, like mass sales manager and something like that so they can see how many pipelines and how many backlogs they have currently with them and so that they can take an action on top of that that's from the sales standpoint and second thing is from the microsoft teams integration so this is a space i would say everyone has to keep an eye on uh, if you are using microsoft dynamics 365 because uh, there are there has been a Microsoft Teams native integration that's been um, built as part of Dynamics 365. So you can see, um, if I give an example, probably you'll understand if you have not explored before, but if you have not, I strongly recommend to start using it because it provides a native uh, capability of it's such a beautiful integration between the Teams um, and the Dynamics. So for example, one scenario, let's say there is a case being created and the customer service uh, person is working on the case and uh, he would like to get a help from that so there is an option where you know he basically uh, to swarm case it's called swarming a case where uh, the moment he he, he uh, does that the artificial intelligence kicks in and it it identifies who are the other customer service representatives who have done or worked on similar um, uh, request on that the case has, as, or who has experience on this, on, on, you know, who, who could uh, help with this case. It will send a request to the those members in the teams, and when they accept it, what happens is it will create a group, uh, a teams group, and then it will have the teams embedded in the case form itself, and you can just start asking them, hey, uh, it seems like you have worked on this, can you please share some information or any data you have on top of that, something like that. So it's real time chat feature within the case and that too you don't need to know or you might not know whether whom you need to ask the system will find the artificial intelligence will find the suitable other uh, staffs who have worked on similar stuff and then it will suggest them and you start interacting with them and all and the whole interaction is actually saved as part of the particular case or ticket right uh, as an activity there and whenever you want you can go and uh, review it and it will be scoped within that case you others cannot be seen in, uh, cannot see that yeah so there are other things which have previously announced in terms of teams integration i strongly suggest um, that is one area like it's going to be a, um, a huge thing i would say uh, to you know uh, uh, explore and try and it will definitely have a good uh, business value i would say and um, can others please drop your hands if you have unless if you have any questions so because uh, if you have questions, I strongly suggest you raise your hand and then you can clarify it in there. And uh, until then, I mean, unless you probably you can drop your hands if you already raised before. So I'm going to move on to the Power Apps next. Um, so Power Apps, that is something called Power FX field. So if you have used Power Apps and Dynamics, you know the calculator fields where you can have a calculation to do something for the fields. Power FX field is way advanced. Uh, then the calculator field. So it's basically you can add a field of type power FX. It's basically you can build a power FX query. So if you have used the Excel and uh, Canvas apps, you know what power the power of power FX query, and you can just type the query in the uh, field, and then 
the field will have the value as a result of that query. So you can imagine the capabilities of that. It's not just any more uh, calculation. It's going to be more powerful, whatever the power FX can do, like look up uh, you know, the calculation. You can uh, get the related data and all those things, you know, you can get and manipulate and then uh, display in the field. Yeah, there are some limitations around that, which, you know, we will uh, share in uh, the detail later. But yeah, uh, that's just something I definitely see, you know, Oh, that's definitely amazed me and I, I I recommend that you go and check some information on that. And second thing is co-authoring, right? So if you have worked uh, in Dynamics or Canvas apps or more driven apps a lot, you know that if someone is working, it basically locks the other one, especially Canvas apps. And uh, for other apps, if you're working and others can't really see what is the progress the others are making. So what uh, Microsoft has brought in is something called co-authoring, similar to how you have a Microsoft Doc uh, uh, that's uh, an online and then basically in the share drive or SharePoint and multiple people can just edit and do whatever changes they can do in the doc and then it just renders. Similarly, multiple people can work on a single screen and uh, uh, it will basically synchronize the updates in real time, right? So what it does behind the scene is it uses Git. So you have to set up the Git as a prerequisite you can still try, it's a preview feature. If you go to your preview, uh, uh, powerups.com and then you can uh, just enable that feature and then you'll configure the Git for that. It can be GitHub or it can be Dev Azure DevOps, but it uses a Git uh, component. And then once you set up the Git, it will basically keeps um, and using the Git as a backend to basically render these changes instead of the XML comparison, which it used to do for the solutions and other components. Yeah, that's something interesting as well. So I uh, know you can uh, take a look at that uh, co-authoring feature. And uh, now we'll move into Power Automate, right? And uh, Power Automate, uh, there are, for Power, F Power Canvas apps, for Power FX, we know that there were this natural language processing uh, feature that's been released a while ago where you tell um, uh, type that, no, I want to search I want to get um, customers who have uh, in, let's say, Illinois region or let's say in the Sydney region and the, the uh, studio will build the formula for you. Similarly like that for Power Automate, when you say that you, know, you want to, let's say, I want to uh, get all the accounts from Dataverse who was created last one week and send a notification email. And then eventually Power, once you type that uh, the sentence, Power Automate will, build a flow for you with you know like the actions uh, steps uh, and then you can extend from there so how cool is that right so that kind of updates is something that's been announced recently and next thing is uh, if you have worked in power automate or flow you know that building an expression it's not a um, um, straightforward thing and you can't see the complete expressions when you actually uh, use them. So what Microsoft has done is you can use examples, like you wanna have some examples dat data in certain format and Flow or Power Automate will generate the expression for you. Yeah, so that kind of uh, upgrades have given and there are nice minor upgrades like the changing owners. So if you have using Power Automate, you know that um, if someone is created the Power Automate, unfortunately, let's say by on their own name, instead of using service account or something, and they leave the company, you know how painful it is, right? You have to, it's not easy, you are deploying, your, your flows will stop running, and then you have to uh, have some cutoff in the production, and then you have to do some, you know, changing the owners and all those stuffs. But now there is an inbuilt feature announced in the part of Power Automate where you can actually go to the, uh, in the editor, you can have uh, the three dots and then click and you can see the owner where you can just change the owner right away. And then you don't need to, you know, have the whole uh, uh, headaches of uh, changing the owners, you know, uh, in other ways. And uh, the other one, last one is, uh, you can have more columns in the flow history. So it's it's an incomplete, I should have added, add more columns in flow history. So, you know, if you have used Power Automate, you will have the history of the, uh, Power Automate um, and it can go, it can create a lot when you have scheduled flows or, you know, uh, frequently triggered uh, uh, flows. So in that case, you know, it's always when you try to debug something or analyze something, it's always a pain when you don't know which one is that, uh, even though the timestamp is one of the uh, thing, but still you don't know what are the filters you have passed. So you have to open the flow runs every time and see what is happened, what has happened. But now what you can do is you can add more columns to the flow history right there. 
like if you want to see the time you want to add more specific uh, attributes that you have passed so that you can have more columns and you can just know okay which is the flow history you want to open and explore further and you can just open it instead of trying you know uh, opening many things and then trying to find out which one you want this might be small things but it really saves lots of our time and you know efforts when if you have worked on that you might be able to relate it and finally uh, power pages right power pages is as you know it's the fifth product in the power platform space so previously it was uh, called power portals uh, previously before that was dynamics portals and before that it was adx portals but now uh, from power portals they just created a whole product called power pages so the difference is you got the platform basically uses the same feature of power portals it's a separate product and it gives such a nice maker experience uh, like power power um, power apps uh, you know the same studio experience and where you can basically drag and drop and build a whole uh, you know, professional websites and enterprise grade websites without any code at certain level. Um, yes, that's what the Power Pages does. And it's the general level, it's, it's available, uh, it's in GA from uh, this Ignite. And apart from this low code availability, uh, you, know, you, you can do lots of things in the low code. It's, it's not just you know, like basic feature, you can have grid, you can have upload control, you can have a, a advanced grid, in fact, not just simple grids. Right? If you, I will also share some contents on that. On so it has, um, if you if, to extend the portal, right? And uh, if previously, if you want to edit it in the code, like with VS Code or something like that, you have to install some uh, command line tools and then all those libraries. And uh, then, then only you can open the actual package in the Visual Studio or VS Code. And then you want to edit for the pro code experience. But now Microsoft, uh, no, that you know when you edit something it opens the vs code in the browser itself right in the next tab and you can edit and save it it immediately reflects in the portal so they have given that kind of flexibility with the pro code tools like vs code uh, and there is another uh, feature which i have not mentioned here so now portal you have option to make a portal page uh, private or public so by default private which means let's say you development team is all on the page it's not yet ready to open to public you can just keep it as private and you can do all the changes and then you publish it and then you make it public then only it will be visible to public until then it will be only for the private and people whom it has been shared with and the last one from the portal of our presentation it's a big uh, cost cutting i would say that new licensing model uh, as you know like uh, is given to us you know in compared to the previous one i would say because the previous one the licensing was if you have worked you know that it's based on the uh, login um, login based models where each login is considered as a 24 hour session so if someone is working let's say all the 30 days they have to buy 30 sessions and you know like 100 sessions was 200 dollars uh, previous talking about standard protocol it's not the dynamics are so standalone portal license was like that but now they have reduced a lot to instead of login based license it's now um, uh, uh, monthly as per site per month per user based license so it starts with two dollars so it starts with um, uh, 50 cents or 75 cents i believe uh, they have three tires until hundred thousand users sorry until ten thousand users it's two dollars per user per month per site so if you have a website, you're only going to pay $2 maximum for a user, even though the user logs in for 30 days, you know, consider. Steve, I'm sorry to interrupt, actually. Can you turn off the video? Because the internet is low, it seems. You are breaking. Yeah, correct. Let's give it a minute till he's back. Yep. In the meanwhile, post this, we are starting with the knee session, correct? Oh, yes, please. Hmm. Ajiva, are you back? Oh, looks like he got dropped off. 
Okay, yeah, sorry, I think there is some issue with the thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much done. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yep, can you hear you now? Good. Yeah, so sure. awesome. Yeah, so the licensing uh, is, uh, in short, licensing has reduced a lot. I'll share the details uh, shortly in the chat. And yeah, with that, and I'm done with my updates, uh, the recent updates that I strongly recommend if you go, go and check it out about it, and then definitely you can incorporate in your projects. And there are like nice features and it's going to save lots of time and add lots of value to your business. With that, I'll pass it to Darani and thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity, the organizers, and thank you everyone for joining today. And I will be actively, uh, I'll be active in the chat. I'll be sharing those details about whatever I discussed now in the chat for you to explore later. Thanks. Thanks, Jiva. It was a detail thank you, Jiva. what we have seen in the Microsoft Ignite 2022. Thanks for that. It would be helpful for the people. And yeah, today we'll see like. Uh, there any? Yeah. Hello. Rish, you want to say something? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, that's pretty much it. I think uh, Jiva covered. Um, all the updates and uh, yeah, with that we start with the the next session. And um, so today we are going to be talking about ALM for Power Platform. Of course, Darni will introduce himself, but before I, before he does that, uh, you know, um, again, welcome to this session. And uh, so Dharni is a seasoned Dynamics 365 slash Power Platform uh, evangelist here, and uh, there's a lot to learn from him. And this is one of the important um, aspects of Power Platform, which is underutilized, I believe. Um, and me personally, just because, you know, um, the size of the project, it, if it's difficult for us to decide if we should use ALM for not, uh, I would strongly recommend we do. And even I will know today why. So that's why Darni is uh, going to help us today um, understand and simplify why we should use ALM for Power Platform. And that's why he's going to take us from being a novice to an expert. Um, so with that, Darni, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, post his session, we do have uh, a break, and uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, all right, Dharni, um, so over to you. Yep. Thanks, Priyash. Thanks a lot, uh, Priyash, for the the welcome note. Thank you so much. And as the Priyash mentioned, like uh, today we'll see like uh, the ALM for the Power Platform. Before getting into today's topic, uh, let me take some time and briefly introduce about myself. Myself, uh, Dharani Dharan Balasubramaniam. People call me Dharani. I'm based out of Sydney, Australia. I work as a senior manager with Capgemini, and uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP in business applications for last two years. And uh, I'm a Microsoft MCT, and also I'm leading the Malaysia and the Tamil Nadu Dynamics 365 and Power Platform user group. And also I'm part of Asian's business applications user group. And also, like I personally do technical blogging, especially on the the CI/CD and the ALM for the Power Platform topics. So, so yeah, post the session, I will share my LinkedIn handle and uh, my the technical blog URL in the chat window. You guys can go through it. And uh, while implementing the ALM for Power Platform, or in case if you get stuck somewhere between the Power Platform or the Dynamics 365 CA, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy and glad to assist you on your on your queries. And uh, before getting into the topic, like uh, we'll quickly see the agenda of today's session. And uh, so here is the agenda. First, we'll start with what is application lifecycle management and what are the key areas and stages of application lifecycle management. And we'll see like why the ALM is so important nowadays. And uh, we'll see the environment strategy and uh, we'll learn about the Power Platform solutions and uh, we'll learn the ALM capabilities and tooling and uh, we'll learn the ALM tooling stack and what are the DevOps tools which is available, the open source and uh, with the some few has been released by Microsoft and a few has been released by a few other community folks. We'll see all those things in detail and we'll Take one ALM process upon the Power Platform and we'll see the system demo because lots and lots of process. So each and every company will have their own requirement and based on the requirement, they will be 
are deriving the process but for today's demo i'm just picking one process and we'll go through that uh, process uh, in a demo and then finally i will take up the question and answers and uh, throughout the session uh, like uh, yeah i would like to keep this as an interactive like if you guys uh, have any questions then always raise your hand or you guys can unmute your unmute your mic and uh, you can ask your question yeah Yeah, today's topic is about the ALM for the Power Platform. Before we go deeper into this uh, tool itself, I need to explain the concept of ALM itself so you can understand and answer by yourself why it matters in today's condition. And hopefully you can also experiment, apply this, and uh, you can give a feedback to us whether it is beneficial or not. And also, as I mentioned, like if you guys stuck somewhere, then always please feel free to reach out to me. And this slide mainly speaks about the definition of the ALM. And uh, the ALM is the, the life cycle of the application itself. The key word here is all about the governance, the development, and also the maintenance, which contains the requirement management, software architecture, development, testing, maintenance, change management, support, continuous integration, project management, deployment, release management, and the governance. These are all the things which comes under this application development uh, the life cycle management process and uh, now let me take some time and speak about what all the stages in the EL ALM process. Uh, the first one is the governance which includes the requirements management, the resource management, nurturing and some of the system administration such as the data security, the user access, change tracking, review, audit, deployment control and rollback. All this are falls under this governance. And the next we do have the application development. This application development includes identifying the current problems, uh, the planning, design, uh, building, and testing the application and its continuous improvement. This area includes the traditional developer and also the app maker roles. And the next we do have the maintenance as the third stages of ALM. This includes the deployment of the app and the maintenance of the optional and the dependent uh, technologies. And this maintenance is also includes the, the operation. So once everything is, once the project is in go live and we need to take, up, uh, take care of the complete operation. So whenever the new change request comes, then we need to prioritize based on the business needs and then we need to deliver and uh, we need to take care of the deployment. If something went wrong, we need to take care of the rollback. So all those things are will fit under this maintenance phase. And to make it easier, uh, you can see in this diagram, this governance, this application and the maintenance one. And um, here are the, uh, the key areas of the ALM. And uh, these are all the key areas like uh, requirement management, uh, design, build management, software configuration management, and uh, operations and maintenance, uh, test manager, user experience. So in the requirement management, uh, uh, in this will we need to will be documenting, analyzing, tracking, prioritizing, and agreeing on the requirements. Mostly it would be kind of the discovery and the analysis phase. We'll sit with the business and we'll go through the workshops with the business and we'll gather the requirements from the business and then uh, we'll be uh, designing it. So we'll be designing it and we'll be doing the implementation playback with the business. And once everything is uh, finalized, uh, then I will get into the build management. Build management is also known as the code management phase. It's nothing but the implementation phase. So it is the process of converting the, the source code files into a standalone software component. In the stage, an application idea, whatever the idea we formed in the design, we will transform that idea into an actual application. That's what we do in this build management phase. And during this uh, build management phase, the application is built, tested, and deployed, and the tester begins preparing their test cases and write a test script for the testing phase. So all those things are the, the people will be doing it in the test ma the build management phase. And the next, we do have the software configuration management. It's an another ALM stage where the development team systematically organizes, manages, and controls the changes in the documents codes and other entities during the application, the development lifecycle process. Next, we do have this operation and the maintenance. It's the 
uh, followed by the software configuration, the operation and the maintenance will fall. And in this ALM phase, uh, we'll have the process of monitoring, uh, management and the development of the applications will begin. In uh, DevOps, this, this ALM phase, it covers release, config and the monitor, especially this operation and the maintenance phase. And uh, in this phase only, we'll, we'll be finding and resolving the bugs and this phase helps you to plan and prioritize the next updates to the product. So all those things will be taking care in this particular phase. And next we'll be having the testing phase and the testers need to verify that the application is complying with the requirements defined in the user story at the initial step in the requirement management. The people will uh, do the, the workshops and they will come up with the user story and they will define the acceptance criteria and the user story. And in the test management phase, the people will take uh, all this user story and they will test it against the acceptance criteria, which is updated there. And they will check whether it is qualifying that acceptance criteria or not. So that's what uh, the people will do it in the testing management phase. And next we do have the maintenance of the user experience. It's a traditionally the longest stage of the ALM process. Still, it is also the one where the participation of the testing and the development team is usually the lowest. So completely the, after the application is developed, the role of the users comes to the play, nothing but the business users. They will come into the picture and they will check the entire application and share their feedback based, uh, share their uh, experience based on their feedback. The final application would be delivered in this user experience phase. This is completely and uh, we call it as a UAT phase. So the people will completely will sit and they will go through their user experience. They will go through the complete application and they will share their uh, experience based on the uh, feedback. And these are all the key, uh, the areas of the ALM. And if you ask me like the why the ALM is so important, uh, the first one is uh, regarding the good visibility. When you're applying a changes and being tracked in the source control, everyone can verify who do the changes. Is it makes sense to change in that component so all those things will be able to achieve it if you have the ALM in place. And the next one is all about the communication. So we can communicate effectively if the ALM is there in the process. For example, uh, if the developer is going through the user story and if he feels that the user story is not clear and he don't want to move out of the system and he don't want to reach out to the product owner or the business users to clarify that, from the, the Azure DevOps itself or the user story, we do have the comment enable for it over there. He can point that to either the business owner or the product owner, and he can point it to that person and he can put all our queries over there so that all the communication would be effectively there in one place to keep a track of what is happening in this particular user story. And uh, once everything we push to Git, uh, we know the history of all the changes so that it would be easy for us to track it. For example, uh, if I'm working on one of the web resources and the developer A is coming tomorrow and if he is working on the user story, he is working on that particular web resources. Annoyingly, like uh, if something went wrong with that web resources, then quickly we'll be able to go to the Azure DevOps and we'll be able to track it like who has developed, uh, who has worked on this particular web resources on which date, when it got overridden. So all those things easily will be able to track it. And uh, the purpose of the ALM is how to make everything automated. So of course, if everything is automated in the place, then uh, the, once the automation is already set up, obviously the cast is going to be effective. We are not going to do the same activity by putting the people over there again and again. So it's kind of the framework we'll, we'll be building and we'll be keeping it over there, the process. So once everything is automated, then that would be uh, easy for the maintenance and the cost effective and you can test it uh, frequently whenever you want like a once the deployment is completed to new instance, then uh, you can have your regression suit uh, tied to that uh, the release definition. Then you can hook that particular uh, a task inside your release definition and you can uh, trigger the regression testing for all the test cases you are having it so that it will complete the regression test cases automatically uh, by uh, going through all the, the test suit you have defined in that uh, release definition. And uh, this is why the ALM is so important. Uh, 
so if you if we we are will get all these benefits if you have implemented alum for the power platform projects or the dynamics the sexo project if it is there in the place then it saves a lots and lots of time and the cost effective so you can consider uh, yeah with this points you can consider implementing alum either if it is a short project or a lot large project you can go for implementing the alum for the power platform for sure and uh, yeah on top of the importance like these are the some of the advantages will get it so alm helps you to control the system by organizing and tracking you can share the defects across the project reducing the risk by helping alm offers integration with the multiple testing tools and uh, it helps to get the clear direction for an app before and during the builds and without an alm it is hard for a software development team to produce a software at the speed and agility needed at a to stay competitive with the other products and alm efficiently delivers the software with a maximum tax on the team so yeah these are the some of the advantages we'll get out of the alm and there are few key things if you want to implement the alm for the power platform and here are the few cute uh, here are the few key things actually the environments uh, uh, the solutions and the source control. So we'll see like uh, each uh, one uh, uh, one by one in the detail. Yeah. If you talk about this power platform in particular, uh, like we needs to know mainly those three components: this environments, uh, solutions, and also the uh, the source control part. The first one is the environment. Here we'll see the environment strategy, how you can keep it for the power platform project. And as I'm mentioning now itself, like uh, this is not the predefined or anything like that. So each and every organization will have their own requirement. In some organization, the UAT won't be directly, it won't be there after the test of the production will be there. And some organization will have the UAT and in between the UAT and the production, there would be one more instance called a pre-prod. So it's completely depends on the organization needs. So based on our current requirement, we have come up with this environment strategy like, uh, yeah. So if you by any tenant, if you log in with the any tenant, uh, uh, the, by default, the default environment will be there. A single default environment is automatically created for each tenant and it is shared by all the users in the tenant. Whomever is part of that particular tenant, they will be having an access to the default environment. They can play around uh, by creating an apps or by creating a power automate. They can play around with that just for the POC purpose, just for the learning purpose. And then uh, next we do have the development environment and the development environments is nothing but a sandbox environment. It's a non-production environment of a dataverse. It's an isolated from the production. A sandbox environment is the place to safely develop and test an application changes with a low risk. And sandbox environment include capabilities that would be harmful in the production environment, such as the reset, delete, and the copy operations. All those things you will be able to perform it in the, the dev environment. And then uh, next we do have the test environment and dev environment is the place where the developers will develop all their components and test environments is like the testing team there. The, uh, the integration, the system integration testing team will come into the picture and what all the components uh, the developer has developed in the dev environment that would have promoted to the test environment. System integration team will validate all the user stories. They will validate all the acceptance criteria, whether it is matching with the requirements or not in the test environment uh, yeah basically in the test environment the business users won't be having access and uh, yeah you uat environment is the, the third the fourth one which we are seeing in the screen and this is mainly for the business users uh, once everything is completed then the business user will come into the picture and they will start uh, validating all the user stories uh, in the uh, 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 Azure DevOps, they will go through all the user stories. They will validate against the acceptance criteria. And uh, once if they feel everything is fine and they will give the go ahead and uh, that will get promoted to the production environment. And this UAT environment is accessible only to the business users. Uh, mostly like uh, all the developers and the testers won't have uh, access to the, the UAT environment. They should not have access, but 
real time the the people will have access in order to debug something and all but uh, typically typically like if you are maintaining a proper alm process then uh, it's a thumb rule that the developers and testers they should not have access directly to the uat environment so that they won't go and modify anything directly over there yeah and next, uh, the last one is the production environment. From the name itself, uh, literally, you will be able to know that uh, this environment will put into the operation for the for their intended use. Once everything is completed, then this uh, will be deploying all these components into the production environment, and the end users will be accessing this production environment in order to access the, the application which the development team has built. And uh, here is the environment strategy. And then once we decide about the environment, the next thing what we need to do is like uh, we need to um, take care of the access, the secret role for each of the environments. The develop uh, this a default environment, the everyone will have access. Whomever is part of that development default environment will have the access. But the dev environment only the developers whomever is going to work on the user story, only they should be having access to the dev. Similarly, like system integration testing, only the system integration testing people should have access and the UAT should be accessed to only by the business users and production is also the same. For all the production deployments and everything will be having some dedicated application user and will be leveraging that application user and will be taking care of all the deployments in the production environment. Hello. Uh, Dharani, you continue. I think uh, someone outside actually is talking internally. Maybe. Ah, okay. Now the next we do have the solutions. So the next the key thing, uh, uh, if you want to implement the ALM for the Power Platform, the next the key thing what you guys need to know is the solutions. And uh, we need to have the good understanding of the solution framework and its uh, capabilities is required to implement this uh, ALM process. So as part of this, uh, we'll see like uh, what all the solution components will take some time and see what is the managed and unmanaged solutions and what are the solutions lifecycle which is available in the Power Platform. And then we'll see the, the solution publisher. Now, uh, as part of this, first we'll see the solution components. So, yeah, these are all the solution components. Uh, yeah, uh, this very, uh, you know, most uh, simplistic way, if I need to sell, uh, tell this, the solution is a container of all the application components. In a Power Platform or the Dynamics 365 CE, so there are lots and lots of components like entities. Entities will have attributes, forms, views, charts, relationships, uh, then global option sets, uh, web resources. Uh, web resource also like HTML files, uh, JavaScript, uh, images, dashboards, uh, ribbon, sitemaps, and then we'll be writing lots of custom assemblies if you want to extend our requirement uh, like uh, plugins, custom workflows, actions, and uh, Power Automate, business rules, business process flows, and out of box workflows. And uh, apart from that, we do have the reports, email templates, document templates, security roles, virtual entities. See, these are all the components where the developer will be working on. If they want to extend the, the Power Platform or the Dynamics 365 CE, and uh, uh, these are all the ways we can extend it. We can achieve our own requirement by customizing these components, or we can build a new components and we can put it over there. So all these components are the solution components. Once the development is done, then we will pick all these components. We'll add all these components into one solution, and the solution is nothing but a container. And that container, it's like we are putting all the things into one container and taking that container from one place and moving it to another place. So that's what, uh, in a simpler in simpler way, that's the thing uh, the solution will do. We'll put all the components into one solution, and uh, we'll export the solution from the dev environment, and we'll import that solution into a target environment, nothing but an the test environment, UAT, or the production environment. So 
we cannot like each and move the each and every component from one place to another so that's the reason the solution uh, is kind of a container they have given will put everything into one box and uh, will be taking that box from the one environment to the another environment and uh, next we do have this uh, managed and the unmanaged solutions so i think uh, if you are in the power platform on the dynamics world so you might be aware of this uh, the solution concepts here what is this managed what is this unmanaged solutions unmanaged solutions are used in the development environments while you make changes to your application unmanaged changes can be exported either as an unmanaged or managed exported unmanaged versions of your solution should be checked into your source control system and unmanaged solution should be considered your source for the power platform assets when an unmanaged solution is deleted the only the container of any customization included in it is is deleted all the unmanaged customization remains in effect and it belongs to the default solution Whereas if you delete the managed solution, it will get re removed from the instances directly and the components won't go and sit into the default solution. Whereas in the unmanaged, uh, unmanaged solution scenario, it's not like that. Even though if you are deleting the unmanaged solution from the instances, all the components, whatever the components, it's part of the particular unmanaged solution, it will go and sit into the default solution. Yeah. And managed solutions are used to deploy to any environment that is not a development environment. So yeah, my suggestion would be like you keep only the development environment as an unmanaged solution, rest other environments like a test UIT and the production as an managed solutions. And this managed solutions can be serviced independently from the other managed solutions in an environment. As an ALM best practice, managed solution should be generated by exporting an unmanaged solution as a managed and considered a build artifact. So typically in the ALM process, so what we do is like once the developer completes the user story, like uh, is the responsibility to trigger the build by pointing to that particular solution in the dev environment. And then uh, it will export that solution from the dev environment and it will unpack it into a folder and you can save that uh, unpacked versions into our source control and then uh, uh, in your build definition you can point to that source control folder where the unpacked files are saved from there you can pack it into an managed solution and you can push it into an artifactory then the release definition can pick and it can pick the the solution from the artifactory and it can import that managed solutions into an higher instances like test environment, pre-prod and the production environments. And uh, yeah, and a few of the things are there, like uh, see that uh, unmanaged solution allow the direct customization, but whereas if you are promoting the changes to an uh, uh, higher environment as a managed solution, then uh, that uh, you cannot modify anything in the managed solution but still you can modify the components directly you can go and modify the components which is available part of the managed solution you can go to the default solution and you can do it but if you do that next time if you pick the solution from the dev environment and if you move it to the production environment as a managed solution what all the things you have done manually in the managed solution that will get overridden automatically okay if any unmanaged layer is there as part of that managed solution so if you import and manage the solution again then all those unmanaged layers will get deleted automatically and the managed layer get overridden with the actual thing which is there in the development environment so whatever things you have done manually so uh, it will get uh, the overridden one is that and the other the real problem what you face is like uh, uh, we should not allow the developers to touch the CUIT and the production environment. See, by by chance, the people, what they do is like, uh, if they want to deploy things quicker or the faster, what they do is like, they will directly connect it to the UIT and the production, and they will go to the default solution, and they will modify the components directly, okay, for a quicker deployment. But uh, ideally, we should not do that. If you do that, what will happen is, one is like, the next time it will get overridden, what they do is like they will do it directly over there, but they won't do the change in the dev environment. They will miss to do that. So next time, if you pick the solution and if you move to the higher environments, 
so that will get overridden and whatever the temporary fix they have fixed in that particular environment all those things will be gone so we should not encourage the developers to do that and or else we should not give the provision to access that particular environment the uat and the the production environments so one is this one uh, and the other real challenge is like uh, um, going forward that component uh, sometimes it won't get overridden at all so that is also one of the real challenge we will face it so in order to solve that problem again you need to create a post deployment step for that particular component alone if it is not updating then you need to manually do the work in the production environment but in order to solve all these problems it's better like don't touch or don't modify anything the unmanaged the managed solutions in the uat or the production environments even though if it is an unmanaged components in the default solution don't go and change anything over there so that's my uh, yeah and advice for not to touch the solutions directly in the uat and the production environments if you are touching it and if something went wrong then there is no point of implementing the salem itself then the salem what are the automations we have done it in order to achieve the salem process that won't work at all so a few things we need to be uh, very clear and we need to bring a strong governance into the place to achieve this complete alm process okay and uh, this in the un unmanaged solution it will hold references to the customization and the components but it won't own them but whereas in the managed solution all the components whatever is part of that solution it is owned by that particular managed solution because we'll be creating a prefix and the prefix will be attached to that managed solution even the unmanaged solution will have the prefix but anyone can modify it but uh, in the managed solution and whomever is part of that the prefix owner only they will be able to uh, change it in the dev environment in the unmanaged solution and they will promote that managed solution into the higher environments and they do not delete or remove components if the solution is deleted. If the unmanaged solution is limited, then it will go and directly sit into the default solution. Yeah, so you don't need to worry about it. But whereas in the unmanaged solution, if you delete the solution from the instances and the directly the solution will get deleted and you will not be able to revert back anything. Okay. And mostly the unmanaged solutions. Uh, so in all the UAT and the production environments, we need to maintain the managed solutions and whomever is building the isvs so they always uh, try to try to put that uh, their solution as a managed solution so that the other people won't uh, steal the work of other the isv components what they have the other companies has built so that's the reason that they always keep the isvs as a managed solution and uh, for isv uh, for generating the prefix for isv we need to reach out to the Microsoft and we need to ask them like we are going to build the ISV and we need a pre pre prefix for it and the Microsoft will give you the prefix and you need to start using that prefix for building the ISV so that it won't later point of time none of the other companies they won't go and claim that this is our ISV or yeah considering all those things the Microsoft has said this practice if you want to build an ISV you need to reach out to them and they will help you with the prefix and with the prefix you will be able to uh, build your isvs and uh, yeah and uh, in the manager solution like uh, at the initial first time you can put all your components and uh, you can move it as a manager solutions in an uat and the production and uh, immediately like if you see some hot fix bug over there and uh, the very critical bug over there and if you need to provide some hot fix to that uh, bug then instead of moving the complete manager solution again what you can do is like uh, you can uh, create a small uh, hotfix solution and you can add what all the components are needed for that particular hotfix and uh, you can move that solution uh, from the one environment to another environment or uh, you can use the pipeline to move the hotfix solutions from the one environment to other environments and these are all the, the differences between the managed and the unmanaged solutions and a few things you need to keep in mind that you cannot import a managed solution in the into the same environment that contains the originating unmanaged solution if you want to test a managed solution then you need to have a separate environment to import into it then when you delete a managed solution the following data is lost 
the data stored in the custom entities that are part of the managed resolution and the data stored in the custom attributes that are part of that managed resolution on the other entities that are not part of the managed resolution everything would get lost actually so we'll not be able to get that back data again and uh, makers and the developers they will work on the development environment using an unmanaged solution once it, everything is completed uh, they will promote the changes to the higher environments as a managed solution okay and this is all about the managed and the unmanaged solutions and we'll see like what all the how this uh, solutioning layering is there uh, we do have the managed layers and the unmanaged layers. So you can see here, all the system solutions will sit as a managed layer and the solution one, the solution two, see all these are the, the managed layers. As I mentioned in the previous slide and what all the, uh, the unmanaged solutions, the active customizations, what all there in the system, it is going to remain in the system as an unmanaged layer, active customizations layer. So this is how the, the layer is there in the power platform environment. And this system solution, this represents the solution components are defined within the power platform. Uh, without any managed solutions on the customization, the system solution defines the default application behavior. So if you install the customer service or the field service, uh, then uh, by default, the system solutions will come automatically. If you're not having any uh, customizations on top of this, then this is system solution. What are the out-of-box behavior? By default, out-of-box behavior is there, right? So that will give the default application behavior, the system solutions. And if you want to uh, have some uh, uh, customization built in uh, any other environment, and if you are promoting that as an, uh, the solution one then on top of the system solutions so the solution one one will come and sit on top of the system solutions and uh, uh, consider this as an uh, the power automate solution and consider this as an custom assembly solution so what all the components you built as a power automate that will come and sit as a solution one managed solution here and similarly like we'll have a separate solution for the custom assemblies and uh, that would be the solution two that will come and sit on top of the solution one as a solution to manage a layer. But if you remove this layer, there won't be any dependency at all with this layer. If you remove this, what all the components of the data belongs to this solution two layer, it will get deleted automatically from the system. Similarly, like uh, if you try to remove the solution one and uh, uh, if it is having some dependency, then it won't allow you to delete it. And similarly, like the solution two also, if you if that solution two is having some dependency with the solution one, then it won't allow you to delete the solution uh, two from the system. So we need to be careful that uh, all the solutions should be independent of each other. We should not create any dependency. Sometimes what will happen is uh, the people will create a circular dependency between these two solutions. Then that would be really hard to manage things in the especially in the power platform and the dynamics 365 ce projects so we need to be very careful while coming up with the solution strategy like this solution strategy like uh, you can go based on the business line like uh, some companies will have the opportunity management team separately project management team separately uh, so similarly like uh, Business lines, so each and every company have the different business lines. So based on the business lines, if you want, then you can go for a solution strategy based on the business lines. If not, you can go for the solution strategy based on the, the technical components, which is there in the power platform, like all the metadata and all the secret rules creation, business process rules creation, entity creation, all those things. So, you can put it into one, one solution, the core solution on top of the core solution. You can have one solution for the web resources, one for the power automate and one for the custom assemblies and one for your dashboards, reports for all those things. You can create a multiple solutions and uh, however the way you want, uh, you can have it actually one is based on the business line and the other one is based on the, the technical, the components which is available in the power platform. 
And in the runtime behavior, this is how the user sees actually. And as I mentioned, this is the unmanaged layer, but all the active customization layers are there, right? So that will to sit on on top of all the unmanaged layers in the system. So yeah, here this is how this the active customization, so the unmanaged the solutions uh, sits here. And this is how the the user sees from the outside. Yeah. And these are all the solutioning layering. And then next we do have the solution life cycle. So in the solution life cycle, mainly we have like uh, this four things. One is like a create, update, upgrade, and the path solution. Uh, we'll go through so each one of these things in detail. Like uh, in the create, what they do is like uh, they will uh, author and export the unmanaged solutions and the update. Uh, the create updates to a managed solution that are deployed to the parent managed solution. You cannot delete the components within the uh, update and upgrade. Import the solution as an upgrade to an existing managed solution, which removes unused components and uh, it implements the upgrade logic. Upgrade involves rolling up all the patches to the solution to a newer version of the solution. And this solution upgrades will delete the components that existed but are but are no longer included in the upgraded version you can choose to upgrade immediately or to stage the upgrade so that you can do some additional actions prior to completing the upgrade so however the way you want you can have it immediately or you can stage the upgrade so that you can uh, do some extra activities in in between that particular time and next we do have the patch a patch solution contains uh, only the changes for a parent uh, managed solution, such as adding or an editing a components and assets, and uh, use patches when making a small update similar to hotfix, as I mentioned earlier. But when patches are imported, they are layered on top of the parent solution. You cannot delete the components with a patch solution. We need to be very careful. We will be able to promote the changes to the other environments with the patch, but we will not be able to delete the components using the patch solution. And this way, when, when, whenever you import the patch solution, uh, so it will go and sits on top of the parent solution. In the previous diagram, we have seen the solution on and solution two, right? If you create a solution two patch solution on top of the solution patch two, it will it will form one more layer and it will sit over there. If you delete that particular solution and what all the changes as you, if you have brought as part of that patch solution, right? Finally, that will get deleted, but still all the changes or whatever you have brought as part of the solution too will remains in the system. And uh, this is the solution lifecycle. And uh, next we do have the the solution publisher. So each and every uh, other solution component, such as entities uh, you create or any organization you make is part of the solution. Because every solution as a publisher, you should create your own publisher rather than use the default one. You specify the publisher when you create a solution. Whenever you are creating a solution, it will ask you to select the value from this particular list. If you're not uh, okay to select the value from this particular list and then you will have a plus button here you can click on this plus button and you can start creating your publisher with your company name and the prefix and uh, you can start uh, leveraging the publisher whatever you have created into our solutions so that at the time of deployment at the time of production time you will be able to identify uh, what components has built uh, which company has built this component see if multiple Partners are has been onboarded for the development. And then, uh, then that time really it would be easy. Uh, it would be easy to find it uh, using the publisher. Okay, and uh, even if you don't use a custom solution, you will be working in a solution which are known as the the CDS default solutions. Uh, but we should be careful while using that solutions. You can customize uh, on top of the default solution. But whenever if you are assigned with the work and all, it's always recommended to create an own publisher, create an own solution and do all the work as part of the solution and move the solution from the one environment to another environment. And the publisher of the solution where the component is created or considered as the uh, owner of the uh, component. The owner of the component control, what changes other publishers of solutions including that component are allowed to make or restricted from making. 
it is possible to move the ownership of a component from one solution to another solution within the same publisher but not across the publisher once you introduce a publisher for a component and a manager solution you cannot change the publisher for the component because of this it's best to define a single publisher so you can change the layering model across solutions later or else it would be difficult you will not be able to change it and uh, let me quickly pull the the crm and i will show you like where this publishers will be there So if you go to the make.powerapps.com, go to the solutions tab. So here, let's see this first environments first. As I mentioned, like here you can see the default environment. So whenever you create a tenant by default, this uh, this default environment would get created. And then you will be you can create your own instances. Where can you if you ask me like where to create the instances, then you can navigate to admin dot or platform dot Microsoft dot com. So if you navigate to this admin .power platform Microsoft com, and if you go to the environments here, you will be able to see all the environments. And if you want to cater a new environment, then from here, you'll be able to create a new environments. You can create a name, give a name, region, and what type of environment you need. Either you need to go for a sandbox, trial, subscription-based production, trial. So all these things you can define and you can create your own environments. For our uh, business requirement, and we just created like three environments. One is kind of ALM dev, test, and the production environment. So we have created this three, and we'll be using this three in today's session. Okay. And uh, yeah. And if you want to create a new solution, then come come to the dev environment, and uh, here if you click on this new solution, and uh, here you will be able to see option to fill out the display name. So I will just give it as a power platform. Classmates. So here it will ask for a default publisher. Here we do have a CDS as a default publisher, one more default publisher, and there is a one publisher for Temi. And uh, here I can create my own. So I will give the display name as a power platform classmates. Yeah, we will give PP classmates. Prefix, I will give it as a PPC. Yeah, once this is done, once it is created, then what all the components you are creating in the, uh, with this publisher, right? Then all the components should be prefixed with a PPC. It will be automatically, it will get prefixed with the PPC. We can see that now I have created the publisher. Once this is done, then we are good to use. All good. Here you can select our Power Platform Classmates Publisher. And if you create, uh, click on this create, then we have created the solution now in the system. See the Power Platform solution got created. So we can uh, add an existing component or you can create an, uh, the new component. These are all the solution components. See, you can see here under the app, you do have an canvas app, model driven app pages. If you go for the automation, then we do have an cloud flow over there. Like we have an automated cloud flow, instant cloud flow, scheduled one, custom connector, desktop flow, then process actions, business process flow, normal out of box workflow. And then you can add a power virtual agent chatbot here, then under the dashboards, like they, they do have a different types of dashboards and you can power BI embedded and also you can add it. Then reports, then uh, column security, field security profile, and then security role and a table. Tables are nothing but the entities. 
earlier we call it as entities now we call it as a tables and the columns in the power platform on top of all this then we do have the choice component library then connection reference a connection role and then settings or templates web resources lots and lots of components are there if you ask me in the power platform all these components once it is built then you will be adding all those components into the solution and we'll be moving this solution from the one instance to the another instance okay just i will quickly some add some existing components i will just check like whether any existing canvas app is there or not okay we do have this two i'm just adding this two and i will create one more table and i will show you like how the prefix is working here i will just add assessments now we have created this uh, uh, table now so the table name is an assessment and if you go to the properties and if you see here here you can see here the ppc underscore what all the fields get created and the table name the table name now it would be like a ppc underscore assessments if you go out you will be if you go to this overview or if you go to the objects in the solution then we will be able to see this see here here we can see the name is the name is ppc underscore assessments since we have created the publisher the power platform classmates we have given the prefixes and pcc ppc will be able to see all the components what are the components you are creating on as part of the solution would get prefixed with the ppc okay but why this asian app and the contact management is having a different one the reason is we have not created this component into the solution these are all the components which we have created outside the solution and we just added those components inside the solution so that's the reason this is not prefixed with our uh, ppc this is prefixed with some other prefix twr and cr40c so mostly like all the system prefix would look like this cr40c and this asian app might be part of some other uh, uh, publisher so that's the reason we are seeing twr underscore yeah so that's it about the solutions and the publishers yeah and once the solution is created then you can come here and you can export the solution as a managed and unmanaged and however the way you want you can will be able to move it to the higher environments okay and here you can see the clone option here you can see the clone a patch solution so if you want to have any hot, hot fix or anything just you create a patch solution here and if you save this then you will be able to see one patch solution will get created on top of this one you can see this here and this solution would be empty you just add what all the components if you want to add move only one component from here to there you just add that only one component into here and you can export the solution and you can import the solution into an other other environment okay and do you guys have any questions with respect to the solutions or publishers uh, do you want to know the difference between the managed and the unmanaged solutions i hope it would be clear but if you guys have any questions then please uh, feel free to ask me okay now next is we'll see like what all the alm capabilities and the tooling which is available like uh, we do have a uh, different phases in the alm process uh, there any one question yeah hello yeah could you elaborate more on the patching of a solution so when exactly we should go for uh, the patches and what yes. are the uh, restrictions if any with patching uh, patching patch solution yeah microsoft always won't recommend to go for the patch solution it's not recommended to go for more patch and patch solutions see since the alm is there in the process they, you won't get a requirement to get into the patch solution concepts itself okay 
but whenever if you want to move on any one on small component like uh, it's an immediate fix it's a high priority issue okay you don't want to delay the production uh, with that uh, fix it's very critical then in this case you can create that hot fix solution as a patch solution and you can move it but microsoft always recommend not to use the patch solutions for moving the components from the one instance to another instance because what will happen is if you keep on creating a patch solution on top of it, then uh, more number of patch solutions into the system, it will uh, give a problem later. Uh, like it will create a more layering on top of the main manager solution. Then that would be difficult to maintain at one point of time. So it's always recommend to move the complete solution as part of the ALM process instead of moving the patch solution. Okay, so and patch solution can be done for both managed and unmanaged or it is just for unmanaged? See, in the development environment, obviously that is going to be an unmanaged solution. You will create a patch solution for an unmanaged solution and you will export that as unmanaged and you will be promoting that managed solution to the target. Am I right? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, this is Srinivasan. Um, sir, I have one uh, clarification uh, regarding the solution. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, let's say we have a solution one, which is unmanaged in uh, development, okay. and we export uh, uh, the manager one, and we are importing in uh, staging, mm -hmm. and the same uh, managed solution we are importing in production. Now okay. uh, we got a requirement to add the one more column in uh, account table. Uh, mm -hmm. Then in uh, what are the testing field or uh, uh, in it, a data type field. Now we want to move this field alone to uh, uh, staging and uh, production. So in this case, uh, do we need to uh, export uh, the same solution as a manager and uh, move the whole solution to staging? Yes. Or you uh, just to, you need to go to the okay. you need to go to the the dev environment and you need to add the column there and then you just come and uh, unpack the solution and export it, then the ALM process will take care of it. You no need to do anything manually here, right? So the ALM process will take care of it. It will pick the solution and it will unpack it and it will put it into a source control. And then the build definition will trigger and then that will pack into a solution, put it to artifactory. Then the release will pick that solution and it will deploy it into your uh, test environment and the production environment. Okay, great. Yeah, you don't need to do yeah. anything manually over here. Yeah, even though it is in one step, don't create a patch solution to move only this actually. See, so you don't you no need to do anything manually. If you implement the ALM in place, you just complete the work and you need to decide like as part of which release this should get moved. That's it. Okay. Rest of the rest of other things, ALM will take care of it automatically. Like how are the way you have configured your build and release pipeline? Okay, uh, I, I need to do it in the same solution, right? Uh, are new yes, columns yes, in the yes. same one man? You, need to, you need to do it in the same solution. If it is a core component, then you need to do it in the core component. You are going to go to the, you are going to create a new attribute, right? That's your requirement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you will yes. go to the core solution and you will be creating that, require, that uh, attribute over there. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for giving it. Yeah. Let's go on. And we'll see like uh, what all the ALM capabilities and the toolings which is available. Like uh, yeah, as we mentioned in the ALM process, we do have a different steps and the stages like a backlog, development, pipelines, the testing, and the operation. So these are all the main five different stages. And in the backlog, we'll what we do is like we'll manage all the requirements and we'll prioritize the requirements and we'll do the sprint planning and all those activities will be doing it in the backlog. It's mainly like creating the user stories and fine tuning the user stories. And uh, product owner will sit with the business and he will prioritize the MVP uh, and all those things. They will do it with the backlog. And uh, they can either use the Azure boards or Jira as a part of uh, using this backlog one. And in the development thing, we'll build the components and we'll have all of our source code into our uh, Git repository, the source code repo. 
and also we'll do the peer review and we'll do the static code analysis all the code analysis whatever things we need to do done the code everything will happen during this development phase and all this will happen in the source control and all the validations everything would be taken care over here and uh, if you ask me like what all the stakeholders involved in this development the citizen devs and the pro developers will be part of it and we'll be using the azure repos or github enterprise or github to maintain all the code all the components what all the components we are building it right so all those things so we can either use the azure repos or github or bitbucket whatever you want as your source control you can use it and the next one is like in order to achieve the ci cd or the lm process we need to come up with the pipelines so all the packaging work provisioning the deployment the validation so all those things will happen over here and uh, here the stakeholders uh, mainly the pro ops and the devops pro devs and the devops uh, these are the two stakeholders which would be involved over here and uh, you can use either the Azure pipelines, GitHub Actions, the Jenkins pipeline. So you can use any one of those things and you can build your own pipelines. And for building in pipelines, you can use either the PowerShell script or Power Platform build tools, which Microsoft has released, or either you can use the XRM CA framework, or you can use the PowerShell scripts, or you can use the Power Dev tools, which Valham C, one of the Microsoft MVP has built it. So lots and lots of uh, the possible ways are available. And uh, again, I'm emphasizing over here, like it is completely based on the requirement. Uh, however, each and every organization will have their own requirement. And based on the requirement, we'll be coming up with this, what technology we are going to use it for building the pipelines or maintaining the development activities, the source control and maintaining the backlogs. So everything, it varies from the organization to organization. But still, we can achieve the ALM for Power Platform using all these things. And next, we do have the testing on the operate phase. And the testing phase, it involves the, the manual testing, automation testing, UAT, sign-offs. And the stakeholders involved over here is like testers and the business users. Business users. In the testing uh, phase, uh, you can, in the Azure DevOps, you can create the Azure test plans. You can leverage that for uh, this your testing phase or either you can use the jira or the azure test plans yes it's again it's a completely up to our organization decision to uh, choose which one to use it but still using both the things will be able to leverage the lm for our platform and next we do have the operate and here we'll mainly take care of the change control deployment rollback all those things here the stakeholders the operations team and the devops will be taking care of this complete phase Either you can use the Azure Monitor or ServiceNow, and yeah, you can leverage any of this, and you will be able to achieve the Power Platform ALM process. And these are all the uh, the ALM capabilities and the tooling you can leverage it for building the ALM for Power Platform. Do you guys have any questions? Next, we'll see the ALM tooling stack. And in this ALM tooling stack, in the Power Platform, we do have the assemblies, web APIs, tools. So the first phase, the whatever I, which we have defined here is like, this is the customizations, what we'll be doing it on, on top of the Power Platform. Like uh, uh, based on the requirement, we'll write the web resources or we'll write some custom assemblies or we'll come up with some web APIs. So all those will be built using here. We'll be leveraging the Dataverse Web API or we'll be using the core assemblies and we'll be building this one. Once this is built, then you can use the automation core and automation core to automate, start implementing this ALM process. And in this automation core, like you can use either the partial script to the maker modules or you can use either the Power Platform CLI uh, so that these tools are really uh, supportive in order to achieve the ALM for the Power Platform process, ALM for the Power Platform. So what I'm trying to say here is like once the developer completes his user story, it's his responsibility to 
export the solution and uh, he need to check in only the necessary components into the uh, from the visual studio so that uh, we are making sure like we are not moving the the unwanted or the non governed changes into the higher environments by doing this we are making sure like the governance is strongly over here and uh, see by any chance uh, if he includes unknowingly also then we'll be having the peer review in the place in, uh, in, in the next stage we'll be having the peer review where the solution architects or the the technical leads they will be doing the peer review they will do the peer review and uh, they will uh, come up with their feedback whether this needs to be included or not but uh, in order to do all those things this automation core plays a vital role uh, you can either use this power platform cli or you can use the powershell scripts to achieve this then in the stack we do have the devops tools so once everything is done now if you want to use some devops tools to automate the deployments in the dynamics 365 or the power platform environments then we need either we need to go for the power platform build tools or we you can go for the power devops or xrm ci framework or you can have your own thing for example if you are going for a jenkins pipeline then the jenkins won't have this power platform build tools power devops or xrm ci framework you need to start writing your own powershell script as a task and you need to hook the task inside the jenkins pipeline in order to implement the alm for the power platform okay and the next to top of all these things then you can create the first class experience like uh, you can build your own canvas app for the deployments or you can have your integrated ux or you can use some tools like collab so using this you will have some first class experience for your complete deployments because see you will build all this piece but we need to have some ui so that the developer can come and he need to give the command right this is the solution i need to deploy and this is the component i need to include as part of the solution so all those things they need some places to give their input so all those things will sit in this first class this experiences you can either go for your own canvas app or integrated ux or you can some use some third party tools or microsoft now they are giving like the alm accelerator for the power platform and if you are leveraging that then it's pretty much simple you no need to implement anything on your own everything is there in the place and you can customize it however the way you want you can just leverage this and you can easily achieve this alm power, power, power alm for the power platform and uh, even you can have all the build definition and the release definition notification in the teams so whenever the uh, the release is deployed into the higher environments if you want to get this notified across the team then uh, you can do it in the microsoft uh, teams so you will get a notification into the microsoft teams once the deployment is completed so all those capabilities are available yeah just you can leverage all those things and you can build an effective alm for the power platform any questions in this uh, stack okay now let's uh, see what all the devops tools which is available there are different uh, the, the devops tools available in order to achieve the uh, alm for the power platform or the ci cd and first we'll see this power platform cli and uh, this this the cli uh, you can use it as an uh, visual studio code extension and uh, you can install to your visual studio code and you can leverage what all the features which is available in this uh, power platform CLI. You can use install this in uh, two ways. One is like you can install using the power platform tools for the Visual Studio code, and you can install the power platform CLI for the Windows by leverage by using these two ways. You can implement the power platform CLI, and I have attached the screenshots also for your reference. And post the session, I will give you the detailed documentation of this power platform CLI, so you can leverage this, but but my suggestion would be like if you are going for a bit bucket or anything where you are not having this power platform build tools then over there you can start leveraging this power, power, power uh, partial modules or the power platform cli or else uh, you can use the power platform build tools or the 
Power Dev tool, DevOps tools, and you can implement it. And this is the Power Platform Build tool, which Microsoft has released by uh, 2020. In June 2019, they have uh, given it for the preview, and by June 2020, they have released it officially. And it supports all the Dynamics 365 CE and the Power Platform ones. It has various tasks. It is having around like 25 tasks, and using that, you can import a solution. You can back up an environment. You can apply the solution upgrade. You can copy environment, create environment. You can set solution version. You can publish the customization. You can export the solution. You can deploy the package. And if you want to do the solution checker against the solution locally, and uh, you can connect to that environment and you can define uh, which rule you want to run. And if you provide the local file, then it will connect to the environment and it will complete the solution checker and it will give you the result. Based on the result, if you want to proceed or if you don't want to proceed, all those things you can determine and uh, you will be able to configure all those things with the help of this Power Platform Builder tools. And also it has the Power Platform uh, Delete Environment. And before the deployment, if you want to take a backup, all those things, copy environment, everything is uh, which is available here. And all those things, it runs mainly using this, uh, the tool installer, the Power Platform tool installer. If you want to leverage any of the Power Platform build tool task in your uh, Azure DevOps pipeline, then it's mandatory that you need to add this Power Platform tool installer as a first step. If you are adding that, then what it will do in the backend is like it will install all the PowerShell modules which is required for the Power Platform in the backend. That's what this Power Platform tool installer will do. This will install all the PowerShell modules in order to run all the other tasks which is required to implement the ALM for Power Platform. Okay. And uh, we do have some other tools also, like uh, we do have uh, other community tools like XRM CI framework and the Power Dev DevOps tools, which Wilhelm has developed. And uh, it has around like uh, around 50 tasks. Some some of the things uh, you will not be able to achieve it using the uh, the Power Platform build tools. In that case, you can either use the XRM CI framework or you can use the Power DevOps tools which Wilhelm has developed and uh, you can achieve the effective ALM process. And uh, we do have the PowerShell module also. Yeah, PowerShell module, you can use it, but moreover, all this are available as a task. So there is no need of using the PowerShell module in Azure DevOps or you, you will have a, Git, a GitHub actions in the GitHub, but only place where you will be requiring this PowerShell module is mainly if you are building an um, uh, pipelines are using the Jenkins. If you are using a Jenkins, then all these tools are not available, like this Power DevOps tools or uh, this Microsoft Power Platform build tools. All those things are not available. Either you need to leverage the PowerShell script or Power Platform CLI to implement the uh, ALM process using the Jenkins pipelines. Okay, so this is just one scenario I have taken and I'm going to uh, go through this in detail in uh, today's session. Like whenever, so consider this as a source environment, like the developer will connect to the source environment and they will, whenever the developer is assigned with a new story, what they do is like they will come up with the solutioning and they will go to the, uh, the solution architects. They will review that solution. If that solution is good, then they will start configuring the changes into the source environment. Am I right? Once this is configured into the source environment, then we need to promote these changes to other higher environments. So what we need to do is like the developer will export the solution and he will unpack the solution and he will check in the necessary components from the Visual Studio. Then once the check-in is done, then automatically the build pipeline will trigger and it will pick all the checked in components and it will form that into a solution and it will push that solution into an artifactory, the Azure repos here. Okay. And once this build definition gets succeeded, then the release definition will trigger and it will pick the solution from the Azure DevOps, uh, the Azure DevOps repos and it will take that solution to the QA environment. 
Q environment is the system integration testing environment where the uh, the system integration testers they will come into the picture and they will carry the testing against all the user stories which is defined in the uh, the requirement gathering phase. They will validate against all the acceptance criteria. So whether it is perfectly working or not. And once if they feel everything is good, then they will give a uh, approval to deploy those changes into an UAT environment. And for the UAT environment and the production environment, the product owner would be the, the core responsible and uh, he is kind of the owner of it. And uh, so once this is completed, then the deployment request would get sent to the product owner. Once the product owner approves that particular deployment request, then we will pick the solution and we'll deploy that solution into an UAT and the production environment. Okay, here you can configure all the approvals. I will show you in the session like uh, how you can co co configure the approvals, all those things so you will be able to do it. And th this is just one of the process which I have taken. But yeah, as I mentioned, like each organization will have their own uh, requirements and they will come up with the own process. But this is one of the process which I have implemented and it is working fine now. And uh, we need to establish a connection from the Azure DevOps to Dynamics, DevOps pipeline to Dynamics. How you can do that is like either you can use the username and password, you can configure as a generic service connection with the username and password, but it, this does not support the multi-factor authentication. So Microsoft so strongly they recommend us to use the service principle and the client secret. That is the recommended approach. So this connection type uses the service principle based authentication and this also supports the multi-factor authentication. So by using this, uh, yeah, uh, it it is more secure actually instead of going with the username and password way. If you establish a connection using the client ID and the client secret, then that is kind of a more secured way. Even Microsoft also recommend recommending us to use the same thing. Okay. So now we'll get into the demo, but before getting into the demo, if you guys want to do it along with me and these are the prerequisites, what we can do is like we can come back from the break and we can start the demo part. And before that, you guys can start uh, gathering this uh, prerequisites like we need an Azure DevOps and then we need a Power Platform environments and then we need an Azure client ID and the client secret and then we need to set up the application user. But in the demo, I will go through all those things in detail. First, we can start with the, the Azure DevOps. Like in order to create the Azure DevOps, what you guys can do is like you need to navigate to the dev.azure.com. So here, dev.azure.com it will ask you to do the sign up then if you do the sign up then it will allow you to create a project you just create a project like this i just created as a uh, yeah power platform key platform like uh, yeah so over here i'm maintaining all the repositories and uh, you can uh, create this azure devops now if you want you can take some time and you can create it yeah, still we have 15 minutes to go for the break. Once we have uh, come back from the break, then I will be uh, doing this activity. So before that, if you want to create this, uh, uh, the DevOps instance and the Power Platform instance and creating an app ID and a secret ID and uh, setting up the application user. So all those things we can do it now, okay? And, uh, once this is done, I will put this in the chat window so that you guys can use it. Okay. So once this project is created, then you can come to the repository and here if you click on this, then here if you click on this new repository, 
then you will be able to create your own repository here. Okay. And this is our first initial step. We need this Azure DevOps. And once this is there, then uh, you can go to the make.powerapps.com and you can create your instances here. By default, if you go for the developer plan and you will be able to see the default environment. And on top of it, like, uh, yeah, for my requirement, I just created the three environments, ALM to uh, ALM dev, ALM prod, and ALM test. So similarly, like you can also create either two or three environments based on your requirement and uh, you can have it here. Hello. Yeah, the name, continue. So in today's session, like we'll see, like uh, we'll create one solution, we'll build some components, and we'll add those components into one solution in any ALM dev environment, and then we'll see like how we can promote those changes to an ALM test and the ALM production environment. Okay. So you guys go to the make.powerapps.com and create this one and cat out like a two or three environments, so that at the time of while doing our practical session, then that would be easy. I have pasted the URL for the make.powerapps.com. So you can go through this one also. And the next thing is like we need to come up with the, the application user. So for that, you need to go for the portal.azure.com. So here, if you go to the app registration, here you will be able to see all the applications. Here you need to go and create one app registration. And uh, yeah, anyhow, like uh, after once we back again, I will be going through this in detail, but I will just on high level, I'm just uh, telling you guys, just provide the name, and give the select this option and if you click on register then you will get registered you, you will get created one app registration like this you can see here and you need to copy this client id client id is nothing but the app id app id is also known as a client id so you need to copy this one and then you need to go to the certificates and secrets and you will be creating a new client secret and you need to config copy that new client secret from here. And one more thing you need to do is like while creating this one, it will ask you for the API permission. Then that time you need to make sure like you are giving an API permission for the dynamic CRM. The user information should be given. If you give this, then only it it this application user will be able to communicate with the dynamics because it, it needs to communicate with the dynamics in order to export the solution import the solution what all the things it want to do with the dynamics in order to make the communication between the azure devops and the dynamics of the power platform so we need this application user and in the application user we need to enable this permission for sure once after enabling this, so you make a note of this uh, app ID and the client secret, which we got created here. Only at the time of creation part, this will show this one. Then after that, it won't uh, reveal this uh, the client ID. So you need to store it somewhere. Okay. And uh, once. Hey, Bala, uh, Ashish this side. Pardon? Uh, hey, Bala, Ashish this side. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you one question here. Uh, is there any provision uh, to create multiple environment uh, while using developer's account? Multiple environments. Yeah, you can go for the trial ones. You can create multiple trial environments. Okay, yeah. thanks. If you go to this admin.powerplatform.com, here the environments are there, right? Here, mm -hmm. if you click on the new, and here you can create the trial environments. You can create a multiple trial environments. Sure, sure. thanks. 
yeah and once this is done then you, what you need to do is like you need to come to the environments then you need to go for settings here you can see the settings then here you can see the user plus permissions if you enable this here you can see the application users then if you click on this one then here you can create it you can see here the alm the service accelerator principle if you click on this new app user it will ask you to add an app so here you will just search with the name add an app from the uh, azure directory you just uh, just copy the name and if you put it here then by default it will auto populate all the values and you can click on save here uh, what i will do is like i will just copy this name so I will... this list will get auto populated here see i can search with the client id search with the client id okay maybe since it is already added i think that's the reason it is not listing here yeah maybe you guys if you try it then if you put this value here whatever is not added i think it will list here you can select and if you click on add then it will take you to this page you can click on create then that will come and get added automatically here okay then you can edit the secret roles and then make sure like you are giving the system admin privilege because it needs to interact with the uh system the devops need to interact with the system for exporting the solution and importing the solution for all the the complete deployment process it needs to get uh, interact with the power platform environment and it should have the system administrator privilege so make sure like you are giving the system administrator privilege for the deployments okay once this is done then the application user setup is also done then we can start working on the uh this process like the whatever the process i have shown right we'll we'll take a simple process like uh, we'll connect to one dev environment we'll create one solution in a dev environment and we'll add some of the components okay and then we'll come to the azure devops and we'll create one pipeline and that will connect to the source environment it will do the solution checker and once that is done we can export the solution published and we can export the solution from there and we'll put it into an artifactory and then we'll create one release definition and in the release definition we will uh, point to the artifactory and uh, we'll make the release definition to pick the file from the artifactory and apply that into one target environment okay and also we'll see like how we can apply the approvals over there and if you want to do the static code analysis or if you want to enable that to get a check-in so all those things so we'll see in detail once we are back from the break Prayesh, like we can i think from we have five minutes right Prayesh, for the break so we'll yeah we, we still have five minutes probably uh yeah you can uh I will you can go this. for break in next three minutes. Yeah, okay. I will share this URLs in the chat window so that the people can. And also, I will just put that slide for all the prerequisites. Maybe during the break time. Uh, that make a good question. Yeah. So the application user needs to be on all the environments that are involved. Yes. Okay. So it's yeah. just not from yeah. the source application, even on the destination application. 
Yes. It has to have uh, sys admin permissions, right? Yes, yes. Okay. We need to, we need to have this application user in all the environments wherever. What all the environments we are going to consider for the ALM setup? ALM. We need to have yeah. this application user in all the places, and it should have the system admin privilege. Yes. So anyone has any questions so far before we uh, pause for break? It will be a 30 minute break. So we will start at 12 p.m. in the third time. Just copying the prerequisites. This prerequisites in the chat window. Yeah, we need Azure DevOps, then Power Platform Environments, Client ID and the Client Secret. We need to, for that, in order to get that, we need to register in the portal.azure.com. Once that is done, then we need to set up the application user in all the environments, like source, the target, the dev environment, test, and the production environment. We'll wind up for break and then we'll come back after half an hour. Sure. Um, I'll stop the recording for now and then we'll restart once you listen. Um, sure, yeah. I think Golak has permissions to stop it. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll stop the recording. Yep. Okay. That was first half, uh, everyone. Again, that, that was very uh, gripping and insightful. Uh, I think many users.